Video Lecture 4A, Introduction to Solution Chemistry, The Ionic Solution Theory of Solutions and Solubility Rules. In Chapter 4, we will look at a variety of chemical reactions, many of which occur in aqueous solution. Remember that, aqueous, that in an aqueous solution, water is the solvent. Therefore, to understand these reactions, we need to know how compounds behave in such an environment. One theory that will help us to understand this is the ionic theory of solutions. This theory was proposed by Sponte Arrhenius in his PhD thesis, written in 1884. Sponte Arrhenius earned the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1903 for this and many other contributions to chemistry. It was known at, in Arrhenius' time that pure water could conduct electricity if certain substances were dissolved in it. In order for a substance to conduct electricity, it has to have the ability to allow charged particles such as ions or electrons to move through it. Arrhenius proposed that a solution is able to conduct electricity if there are ions in the solution. A good example of a solution, type of solution that could conduct electricity is a sodium chloride solution. Sodium chloride dissolves in water when water molecules interact with the solid, allowing for the solid to dissociate into sodium ions and chloride ions. These ions can move freely through the resulting solution and allow for electrical conductivity. Compounds such as sodium chloride are called electrolytes, since when they are dissolved in water, they allow for the resulting solution to conduct electricity. A simple way to test for the presence of electrolytes is by hooking up a battery to a light bulb and electrodes using leads. If the solution contains electrolytes, the solution will complete the electrical circuit and allow for the light bulb to light up. Pure water contains no electrolytes and therefore do not allow the light bulb to light up. We can separate electrolytes into two categories. Strong electrolytes completely dissociate into ions when dissolved in water. Sodium chloride is a strong electrolyte. It completely dissociates into sodium ions and chloride ions when dissolved in water. Since there are a large number of ions in solution, the light bulb lights up very brightly when connected to a circuit. Weak electrolytes, on the other hand, only partially dissociate into ions when, it, when dissolved in water. This results in less ions in the solution. Ammonia, or NH3, is a weak electrolyte. Therefore, when a solution containing ammonia is connected to our simple conductivity apparatus, the light bulb only lights up dimly. Non-electrolytes dissolve in water to give a solution that does not conduct electricity. A good example of a non-electrolyte is sugar. We know that sugar dissolves in water, however, a sugar solution will not conduct electricity, giving a result very similar to the result for pure water on the top right hand side of the screen. It's very important to be able to predict if compounds will be strong or weak electrolytes. One way to predict this is to be able to is to be able to tell if a compound is able to dissolve in water. We call this the solubility of a compound. For ionic compounds, there's a list of empirical solubility rules.
We can use these rules to predict if an ionic compound will be soluble in water. If the compound is soluble in water, then it will be a strong electrolyte. There is a table of solubility rules in your textbook in Table 4.1. The table on this slide is very similar to it. It divides a set of ions into two categories. The first category lists ions that when they're that when they're in ionic compounds will cause the compound to be soluble. The first rule says that group that compounds containing group 1A ions such as sodium, lithium, or potassium or the ammonium ion will be soluble in water. There are no exceptions to this rule. The second rule says that compounds containing the nitrate ion and the acetate ion will also be soluble in water. There are no exceptions to this rule either. Since these two rules have no exceptions, you're asked to memorize them. All other solubility rules after this point will be given to you on any exam or quiz. The third rule states that most compounds containing chlorides, bromides, or iodides will be soluble in water. The exceptions to this rule state that if that compound also contains either the silver, mercury, or lead ions, the compound will be insoluble in water. For example, silver chloride is insoluble in water. However, sodium chloride is soluble in water. The last ion is the sulfate ion. Most compounds containing the sulfate ion will be soluble in water. The exceptions are given on the right. Again, silver, mercury, and mercury, mercury and lead make an appearance, as well as strontium, barium, and calcium. An example of an application to this rule is that calcium sulfate is insoluble in water However, sodium sulfate is soluble in water. The second category contains ions that will cause an ionic compound to be mostly insoluble. The first rule under this category is that most hydroxides are insoluble in water. Exceptions to this rule include compounds that also contain group 1A ions, ammonium ions, strontium ions, barium ions, or calcium ions. For example, calcium hydroxide is soluble in water. However, copper 2 hydroxide is predicted to be insoluble in water. The last rule states that carbonates, sulfides, and phosphates are insoluble in water, except when the compound also contains a group 1A ion and an ammonium ion, or an ammonium ion. For example, calcium carbonate is insoluble in water. However, Sodium carbonate is soluble in water. We can use these solubility rules to predict whether or not an ionic compound is soluble in water. Once again, you are asked to memorize the first two solubility rules, that all group 1A ions, ammonium ions, nitrate ions, or acetate ions in ionic compounds will cause that compound to be soluble in water. To summarize, there are compounds called electrolytes that, when dissolved in water, produce freely moving ions. We can use electrical conductivity to experimentally determine if a compound will be a strong, weak, or non-electrolyte. This can be done qualitatively simply by hooking up a battery to a light bulb 
and immersing electrodes in a solution. You will do a quantitative experiment later on in the course where you can actually measure the con conductance of a solution numerically. We can predict whether or not an ionic compound is a strong electrolyte using the solubility rules. If the solubility rules predict that a compound is soluble in water, it is likely to be a strong electrolyte. We will end by over, take, taking an overview of re reactions that occur in solution. In general, reactions that occur in solution fall under two categories. The first category are acid-base reactions. Acid-base reactions involve changes in how electrons are shared between atoms. There are many type of acid-base reactions. Some that we will look at in this chapter are precipitation reactions, Arrhenius, and Bronsted-Lowry reactions. These are all special classes of acid-base reactions. The other type of general type of reaction are redox reactions. These reactions involve the transfer of electrons between two atoms. Redox reactions are also referred to as oxidation reduction reactions.